Zaner Blozer's Strategies for Writers presents Authors in the Classroom, a live event where students hear directly from their favorite authors and learn about the joys and challenges of the writing process. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Authors in the Classroom. We're so excited to have you join us on this journey through the writing process. I'm your host, Jennifer Prescott, with We Are Teachers. And I'm sure a lot of students watching are curious to know what it's like to write a real book. Well, today we get to find out because our guest author, Kate Messner, is going to take us through the entire writing process from brainstorming to pre-writing to editing and to finally seeing her book on shelves. But first, we're going to watch a short clip about where Kate found her inspiration in the first place. Have you ever wondered what it's like to write a book? For author Kate Messner's Ranger in Time series, the journey started with an idea. What if a search and rescue dog could travel in time? Where would he go and who would it help? Kate Messner is the author of the Ranger in Time series, as well as All the Answers, The Brilliant Fall of Gianna Z, and many under other wonderful books for young people. And she's joining us today live from the North Country Teacher Resource Center in Plattsburgh, New York. Hello, Kate, and thanks for joining us today to celebrate the National Day on Writing. Hi, Jennifer. It's great to be here. What a way to celebrate the National Day on Writing, huh? I'm so excited to meet our student writers that we have with us today, too. Great. Me, too. Kate, can you tell us a little bit more about how you got the idea for the Ranger in Time series? How did this writing journey begin for you? Well, absolutely. My uh, books all go back to a spark of an idea, no matter what the book is. And for Ranger in Time, it was a story that began uh, with a fascination that I had about time travel. I live on Lake Champlain, which is a really historic area. We've had uh, Revolutionary War battles and an uh, important battle in the War of 1812. And I've always kind of looked out my window and wondered what it would be like if I could time travel just for a little while to get a glimpse of what that would be like. So I had tried to write a couple time travel stories that didn't work out all that well. And quite literally, I woke up one morning, uh, still laying in bed, kind of half asleep, half awake, thinking, you know, what if it wasn't a person who time traveled? What if it was a dog and or some other animal? And the truth is, I can't have a dog because I have allergies, even though I love dogs. So I thought, this is it. I can have an imaginary dog now. And so I decided that you know it could be a golden retriever, because that's the kind of dog I love. And the golden retriever could be trained in search and rescue strategies. So he could go anywhere he needed in history, if he could time travel, to help people in trouble. And I grabbed my writer's notebook. I pretty much always have a writer's notebook with me. And uh, the truth is, I don't have one writer's notebook. I have like seven writer's notebooks. But uh, on this particular day, this one was next to my bed. And I opened it up, and I wrote down that idea for the Ranger in Time series. Ranger in Time, Time Traveling Rescue Dog. And uh, this little scribble on a page is really what launched pretty much the whole thing. Wow, that's really neat that just one little tiny phrase can start an entire series that a lot of kids have gotten to know and love. So um, we actually have a group of fifth graders today who are joining us from Cherry Hill, New Jersey. So let's say hello to Miss Sleeth's class. Hi. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. So you've all read the first Ranger in Time book, and you've all completed the downloadable pre-activity available on our website, which asks students to think about where they might send Ranger in history. Can you share some of your ideas with us? Since we live near Philadelphia, one idea we thought of was that Ranger could travel back in time to the year 1776 and help the Founding Fathers while they write the Declaration of Independence. Wow, that sounds like a really, really cool idea. I love that one. That's great. Um, let's let's hear another idea from Miss Lee's class about where Ranger might go in history. Another idea we thought of is that Ranger can travel back in time to the year 1969 and help Neil Armstrong, which is Apollo 11 mission, 
to land on the moon. What great ideas these are. You know, as I, I listen to your ideas, I'm thinking about how you would research those. And, uh, you know, I'm imagining, I'm actually going to be in Philadelphia later this week. I'm imagining a, a trip to Independence Hall to, to check on that. I bet some of you have even been there, and maybe you have some scribbles in your notebooks from having been there. And uh, with the, the moon story, I'm thinking we'd have to build a, some sort of a spacesuit for Ranger, right? That could be interesting. Yeah, that makes me wonder, Kate, have you ever thought about sending Ranger into the future? You know, I, I have toyed with the idea, and it's something that kids ask about a lot. Right now, my heart is in the history. I love the historical research, and uh, doing a, writing a book set in the future, which I have done, requires a whole different process where you're not doing research so much as you're imagining what that future world might be like and doing world building. It's an interesting idea, though. Great. So I want to let all our viewers who are joining us online today that you're also welcome to ask Kate questions as well. So to do that, you simply type your question into the Google Hangout text bar, and we'll get to as many questions as we can today. Um, but now we're going to watch a short clip about the next step of the writing journey, which is pre-writing and drafting. Writing a first draft isn't always easy. It can be challenging to put the story in your head onto paper. A few things that can help are making an outline, doing pre-writing, setting small goals, and checking in with your writing community. Kate, can you tell us what it was like to fight, write the first draft of Ranger in Time number one? Absolutely. So my writing process actually begins long before I start writing. And especially for the Ranger books, which require a lot of research, my writing process begins at the library, usually the, the public library and the college library where I live. Um, and I also end up buying a lot of books, too. For the series, really, uh, some of the most useful books I used for research were training manuals for people who work with search and rescue dogs, with real live dogs. So this one, Ready, Training the Search and Rescue Dog, and this one, Search and Rescue, Training the Canine Hero, ended up being really invaluable. I actually spent some time with the Champlain Valley Canine Search and Rescue Unit as well. That's a real search and rescue team that works with two dogs in particular, Easton and Oakland, who I spent some time with when they were training out in the woods. And then for the first Ranger in Time book, I needed to obviously do a lot of research on the Oregon Trail. It's called Rescue on the Oregon Trail, and it's about Sam Abbott, a boy and his family who are traveling west across the country uh, to the Oregon Territory in 1850. So that uh, research really began with a lot of diaries and journals from people who had traveled the Oregon Trail, some of them published in collections like this, and some of them dusty old leather diaries that I had to travel to see in museums and libraries. Uh, one of the coolest things I used, one of the most interesting resources, was this book, Journal of Travels Over the Oregon Trail. This is a modern version of a guidebook that the real pioneers used when they were traveling west. Uh, it's written by a man named Joel Palmer. So when you read Ranger and Time Rescue on the Oregon Trail, you'll hear the characters referring to Mr. Palmer's guide, and Mr. Palmer says we need 75 pounds of bacon, and this is where a lot of that information came from. And right down to specific things, um, this very specific book called In Tar and Paint and Stone, talks about the inscriptions on Independence Rock. That's a place where the travelers always hoped they would reach by the 4th of July so that they could get all the way through their journey before the snows came in the mountains, the heavy snows anyway. And uh, this is a book all about the inscriptions on that rock. That was a very famous rock where people would uh, write their name when they reached there to sort of celebrate reaching that milestone. And so even the inscriptions that you read about, uh, the real inscriptions that the characters see in the book, are real uh, based on this. Don't even I don't always get the questions answered that I need from books, so after I read through this book, I had to call the historic site and uh, ask a ranger there what very specific inscriptions Sam would have seen when he was in that sort of secret cave on Independence Rock. So it's a whole combination of things that I end up doing for research, uh, depending on the book. One thing I try to do is collect all my research about really specific topics on one particular page. So I'll get a great big piece of paper, 
And for example, this page talks about Three Islands Crossing, which was one of the most dangerous river crossings on the Oregon Trail. And you can kind of see I've collected notes from lots of different sources and different colors here. Um, that's part of my pre-writing process is getting all my notes together in one place. And with historical stories, another thing I need to do is uh, brainstorm characters. So I'll spend, uh, you can see I like my big paper, I will spend time brainstorming about all the different characters. You can kind of see that, you know, Pa and Ma are there. Uh, you can also see on this page that the character named Lizzie used to be named Rebecca. That's one of the places I make changes along the way. And I tend to make name banks, too, for my historical chapter books, because if you think about it, the names that were in existence in 1850 are not always the same as the names we have today. There were no Brittany's or Ashley's in uh, 1850. And so I will make a, a sort of a name bank. You can kind of see just a list of names that I know were in existence at that particular time. And that's based on trips to cemeteries. It's based on census and uh, land transfer records, things like that. And uh, Ancient Rome, which is where the second Ranger in Time book is set, was a whole different set of names entirely. So here's my name bank for the Ancient Rome book. And you can kind of see how that uh, those names were chosen. Some of you who have read that second book in the series might recognize Quintus and Marcus and uh, Gaius, some of the other names. Quite often I'll also make an outline before I get started, but what that outline looks like really depends on the book. Sometimes it's kind of a traditional outline, a list of ideas and what's going to happen first and second and next. Sometimes it's an idea map or a graphic organizer. For the third Ranger in Time book, which is a fugitive slave story, it's about two enslaved children who escaped from a Maryland tobacco plantation. That was a story that moved from place to place to place in chapters uh, as we went through the story. And so for this book, a timeline seemed to make the most sense to me as far as organizing those ideas and keeping track of where the kids were in each chapter. So if I zoom in a little bit, you can kind of see that the story starts on the tobacco plantation in Maryland, but then the kids end up traveling through Odessa, Delaware, through Philadelphia, one of our classrooms will be happy to see that, through Albany, and uh, on to Vermont and northern New York. So really the outline depends on the kind of book that I'm writing and what seems to be the best fit. Once all that is done, then it's time to start on the first draft. And I pretty typically tend to do that from start to finish without going back to revise while I'm writing. I like to get the whole first draft done. It doesn't matter if it's perfect because I know I can always make it better later. That's great. Thank you, Kate. That was really interesting insight into the writing process and all of those diagrams and notes. Um, so we also have a, a group of fourth graders from Hamilton, Ohio, who are joining us today. And I'm sure they're eager uh, to say hello. So let's welcome the students in Miss Gettler's class. Hello. hello. Hi, kids. Thanks for joining us today. I hope you're having a great time. Um, we're really happy to have you with us. So what questions do you have for our author? What inspires you to write about a heroic dog? Well, I think the number one thing is I love history and I love a good adventure. So the neatest thing for me, really, about the Ranger in Time series is, you know how I mentioned I've always kind of secretly wanted to time travel? Writing these books is really the thing that allows me to time travel. Because when I go to the library and I read piles and piles of books about the Oregon Trail or ancient Rome or um, you know plantation life in 1850 or Antarctic exploration, a little part of me feels like I'm not sitting in the library anymore. I feel like I'm off exploring all those places too. Um, and the reason that I chose Ranger to explore is I feel like he can kind of uh, relate to everybody. I mean, who doesn't love a golden retriever? Uh, so Ranger, as I mentioned, is, is kind of my imaginary dog. I figured if you're going to have an imaginary dog, you might as well dream big. So not only is he my favorite kind of dog, he can time travel and rescue people as well. It's pretty amazing. Let's have another student question. Um, from Miss Gettler's class. What type of lead is your favorite to write and why? What type of what? What type of lead is your favorite to write? What type of lead? Wow, I love that you're thinking like a writer there. So you're asking me about how I start my stories. Yeah. And that's kind of interesting. 
Um, one piece of advice that I got, and I wish I could credit the person who said it, I can't remember, was to begin on the day that is different. And so I think if you look at all the Ranger in Time books, you see them starting with some action and with a problem. So for Rescue on the Oregon Trail, we begin as Sam and his family are packing up to get ready to go on their journey on the Oregon Trail. They're loading those 75 pounds of bacon and the cornmeal and, and all the things they'll need for their journey. Uh, whereas in ancient uh, Danger in Ancient Rome, we begin on the day a brand new gladiator arrives at gladiator school to be trained to fight in the Roman Colosseum. So I always kind of, I try to lead with what's different that day that's going to set the story in motion. What a great writer question. That is a great question. Thank you. I think we have time for one more question from Ms. Gettler's class. If anyone else has anything they'd like to ask. Was Ranger in Time your first title or did you have to change it? What a good question that is. So I can actually show you the answer. Remember I told you about that original scribble in my writer's notebook? Sometimes that original scribble catches the title too. And this was one of those rare, rare situations where when I had the initial idea, the first spark of an idea for a book, the title came along with it. Now that's not always the case. As a matter of fact, that's not usually the case. But this was one of those times when as soon as I had the idea, I came up with a title that I loved that Scholastic liked a lot too. That's great. Kate, do you also know when you start out writing the book, I'm curious if you know the final chapter, exactly what's going to happen because you've outlined and you've done all this. Does it ever completely change and you're like, oh wait, I want to go in a different direction? The truth is it almost always completely changes. Um, I kind of feel like my outline is the, the road map that I need to get started, but then as soon as you take one detour, the whole trip changes and you end up, I don't know, my GPS on my phone says rerouting. Uh, I end up doing a lot of rerouting when I'm writing um, just because you have ideas along the way. And um, it, it's interesting too, we're, we're talking about the writing process today in kind of a linear fashion, like we're talking about research and brainstorming and outlining. But the truth is, in real life, it's not always that linear. Uh, I might research and brainstorm and do an outline and then I start to draft but then I realize I have to go back and do more research and maybe something I discover in that new research leads me in an entirely new different direction. So then I go back and I redo the outline and I draft again. So there's a lot of jumping around. Right. Well that leads us right into, um, we're going to watch a short clip about the next part of the publishing process. You know, revising often takes longer than writing the original draft. Sometimes authors rewrite entire paragraphs, pages, or chapters before they're happy with the results. And if you sell a book to a publisher, you will have even more revisions and editing ahead. So Kate, what was your revision process like for writing Ranger in Time? Well, as I mentioned, I do tend to write my rough draft from start to finish without going back to make changes. But that doesn't mean that I don't notice things along the way that I could be doing better. So what works best for me, and you'll find that writers have all different strategies when it comes to this, but the thing that works best for me is to keep a big piece of paper next to my computer while I'm drafting. There I go with the big paper again, right? But uh, I'll keep a great big piece of paper next to my computer while I'm drafting. And at the top, I write known issues. And so this is the paper that sat next to me while I was writing my first draft of Ranger in Time Rescue on the Oregon Trail. And you can see that there are some really specific things I already knew I would want to work on. It's a Sam character arc. I knew that I would want to work on developing Sam's character more and, and thinking about how he changed as the story went on. You can see the second note there says Ranger homesickness. And in my first draft, as I was writing, I realized that if Ranger were suddenly taken away from his regular family that he lives with all the time, Luke and Sadie, he would miss them a lot. And that wasn't present in this story as much as it should have been. And so I'll make a big list of this while I'm working. And that uh, known issues list becomes my really my to-do list for my first revision pass when I'm making changes to a book. Sometimes I also make charts to help myself revise. This is one of those. Um, and it's a, a big, messy chart, but you can kind of see if I zoom in a little bit. 
that I will make a list of all the different characters and ideas that are important in a story. This is actually, wow, you're getting a sneak peek of the third Ranger book here, Long Road to Freedom, and you can see that a feather plays an important role in this story. And I'll go through and mark which chapters that symbol appears in to make sure that if it's important, I'm including it regularly through the story. So I use a lot of tools like that. And uh, then when it's actually time to do the revision, I tend to print out my manuscript and I make changes right on the printed draft. So this is a rough draft of Ranger in Time, Danger in Ancient Rome. And you can see, just as an example, here's the first page of Chapter 9. Pretty much every page of my rough draft ends up looking like this. Right? I decided I didn't like that first paragraph at all. I make myself lots and lots of notes in the margins. I'm looking at word choice along the way and where things could be stronger. And I make notes on all those pages as I write. Pretty typically, I'll do my first draft of a book, make, go through my known issues list, do a second draft, print it out, make changes. Then I like to send the book to a writer friend. And maybe some of you student writers do this too. I bet some of you trade papers and read each other's papers to give uh, one another ideas for how to make a story better. The writers whose books are in your library do that too. Uh, I tend to trade papers with my uh, friend Linda Urban who wrote Milo Speck, Accidental Agent, and Hound Dog True and A Crooked Kind of Perfect. We read manuscripts for each other and we'll make comments and have meetings and say, you know, what did you try to do in Chapter 5? Had you, had you thought about trying this? So usually it's about my fourth draft uh, after all that has happened that I send to my editor at Scholastic and that's when she gets to see the manuscript for the very first time but it's still really only the beginning of the process. So you've done all this work which really isn't like work because you're so passionate about it it's like fun it's exciting it's like but it is work you've done all this work it goes to the editor and then what happens like that's sort of just the beginning what happens next? It is just the beginning. So when I send the manuscript off, um, I'm taking a break from it, and it's in somebody else's hands for a little while, and I will usually switch gears and work on another project for a while. But eventually, I know I'm going to get an email, and that email is going to have a letter, usually a pretty long letter, four, five, six single-spaced pages about my book. And the first paragraph of that letter will say something like, Dear Kate, we love your new book so much. You are a brilliant author, and students are going to love this book, too. Good job. And then the whole rest of the letter, four, five, six single space pages, goes on to say, now, here are the things you need to work on so that this book is even better before kids read it. And so it'll talk about things like uh, developing characters, about describing scenes in more detail. It'll talk about cutting out the boring parts so you don't have to read them. All kinds of changes. And my editor will also go through and make line-by-line -line edits on the manuscript. So this is actually uh, a, a copy-edited or a, a, a line-edited page from the third Ranger in Time book, Ranger in Time, Long Road to Freedom. And you can see that my editor has made comments. There are, there are those whole little, uh, that whole little series of blue comments in the margin. She uses the Microsoft Word comments feature, which I bet a lot of you have on your computers at school, too. And she'll highlight text and make comments on it. So just as an example on this, uh, I have a note about uh, Mrs. Bradley's garden. And Cassandra, my editor, has noted, Clarify that this is a different kind of garden, such as a vegetable or flower garden, to distinguish from the formal garden mentioned above. Tiny little word choice issues um, to the biggest issues of character arc. So pretty much every single page of that manuscript, right, 150, 200 pages, comes back with those little blue notes on it. And then I go through and I'll do usually two or three more revision passes with my editor um, before we, we feel like the book is really in good shape. At that point, another person comes into the mix and that's the copy editor. And that's where we look at grammar and spelling and punctuation and capitalization. It's really the first time we worry about all those things because we want to take care of the big revision issues first. So at that point, we begin to do the copy editing the book goes through numerous rounds of copy editing and final, final proofreading, which uh, happens at the very end. At that point, you can see it sort, sort of starts to look like more of a book. And um, it gets laid out. 
this is this is one of the early pages from Rescue on the Oregon Trail. This is actually the title page, and you can see it's almost done. It's been laid out in the computer. There's space for Kelly McMorris's art there, the illustration. Um, but we're still doing proofreading, and we're actually still making changes at this point. Even though the pages are laid out, we have to make sure there aren't mistakes. And that goes for illustrations as well as the text. It was interesting when we were um, working on final, final proofreading of the first Ranger in Time book, there's an illustration of the main character's dad. This is Pa, and it's a scene where he's making that dangerous river crossing that I told you about, three islands crossing. And this is a great sketch of the illustration, except that several pages earlier in the manuscript, there had been a passage about how Pa was riding across the river, and his hat blew off his head and disappeared and was sucked under the water. And all of a sudden, a few pages later, we have this illustration, and whoops. Pa's hat is back on his head. So if you see the final version of this illustration in the book, you'll notice that not only is it a much more detailed than this sketch, but that Pa's hat is gone after it's been swept down the river. So we're looking at all kinds of things when we go through that final proofreading. And at the end of that process, finally, the book comes to you and you can read it. Well, it must feel great to see your book on the bookshelf for the first time after all this process. So let's go back to Ms. Leith's class. I think the students there might have some questions for you about the revision process. We do a lot of writing at school, and sometimes it can be frustrating to change our work when we think we already have good ideas. Do you have any advice for kids who find it hard to make changes to their stories? I do. So for me, at least, um, if you hand me my book back and you say, this needs to be better, revise this. It sounds like a big, impossible job, right? What do you even mean, revise that? Um, but what happens is when I get my letter from my editor, you have to understand that I have already spent many months, sometimes over a year, working on that book. And I have done a first draft, and a second draft, and a third draft, and a fourth draft, and I've had a friend look at it. And by the time I send it to my editor, I'm saying, here it is. This is the best book I can make right now. It's the very best I have to give you. Help me make it even better. So when I get that note from my editor, I have the mindset that this is like a Christmas present I'm getting. It's a holiday gift because all of a sudden I have a chance to make this book that was as good as I could possibly make it by myself even better. And if you can look at revision that way, it can be really helpful. I am also a great big fan of making lists. So let me just show you. Um, this is one of the lists. Sometimes when I get that letter from my editor or when you get a paper back from your teacher with comments on it, I like to take those comments and turn them into a little to-do list for myself. So um, this book has a list of ranger jobs. Um, and there are things like chapter five, more ranger. Uh, what happens to the first aid kit? I realized that when I wrote the first draft, the first aid kit just sort of vanished, and we needed to explain that. Uh, chapter 5, let Ranger miss Luke and Sadie more. More quilt squares before Chapter 10. All kinds of things. But when I make myself a to-do list with really specific small jobs, all of a sudden that big job of revising feels a lot more manageable. So that's something that I think can help a lot. Great. Well, let's go back to our, uh, our students in Hamilton, Ohio, so they have a chance to ask Kate about this part of the writing process. How long did it take you to get Ranger and Time Trail to be published? How long did it take you to get Ranger and Time ready to be published? That's right. So to go through all those steps of the writing process that we just talked about from the very beginning to the day you could read the book was just about two years. Um, and part of that has to do with my work revising and the back and forth with my editor editing, but part of it also has to do with illustration. Um, the Ranger in Time series is illustrated by an incredibly talented artist named Kelly McMorris. And it's interesting, kids don't always realize this, but when you're dealing with historical fiction, 
obviously Ranger is made up because none of the dogs I know can time travel. But other than that, the history in those books is all really, really accurate. Um, and it requires really, really specific research in order to do that. And that's not just on the part of the author. That's on the part of the illustrator, too. So when Kelly is illustrating uh, a book set in 1850 on the Oregon Trail, she needs to research everything from how big were wagon wheels compared to a golden retriever when she's drawing a picture of Ranger next to the wagon to what would a boy have worn in 1850? How did families cook when they circled their wagons for the night? All kinds of things like that. I just got a, a question via email uh, that from my editor because Kelly is now working on the fourth Ranger in Time book illustrations and that's called Ranger in Time Race to the South Pole and it's set during uh, Antarctic exploration in the early 1900s with the, uh, the Scott expedition. Kelly had a question that was so specific, she was illustrating a scene during one particular part of the journey to the South Pole and needed to know if the characters would be wearing skis on that day or not. So I ended up going back, again we go back and forth to different steps in the research process, I ended up going back to this book which is the journals of Captain Robert Falcon Scott and looking up that particular day in his journal and in the journal of another member of the crew of the Terra Nova to find out were they wearing skis that day. I mean that's how specific the research gets. So I know two years sounds like a long time but there are an awful lot of jobs that have to be done in that, that two years. You must be an expert on a lot of topics by now, Kate. A lot of uh, historical details that you can talk about to anyone you meet, which is which is kind of a nice thing to have. Um, you know, so, that's the most that's the most exciting part of this series for me is I get to just plunge in to research. Um, you know, imagine being able to learn about whatever you want to learn about for months, and that's your job. It's pretty cool. That's great. So now we're going to have, uh, take some time to answer some questions from our online viewers. And first question we have comes from the Smith School in Winterport, Maine. And they want to know, have you ever been so frustrated with writing that you just want to give up and quit? I don't know if I ever want to give up and quit. But for sure, there are days when I want to stop writing for a while and have a cookie. Um, yeah, I mean, writing, a lot of times kids will say, is, is writing hard? And the answer is, well, yeah, it can be very hard because it's an important job. I mean, I consider writing for kids to be a huge honor and a huge responsibility, uh, and I want to make work that's, that's worthy of your time. So it can be frustrating sometimes. Um, never so frustrating that I want to give up because it's a job that I love too much, but certainly frustrating enough that I need to take a little break and go take a walk around the block or, you know, a jog or meditate for a little while or, or have some M&Ms. Sometimes, but never, never permanently. So our second um, online question comes from Carol, I'm sorry, Karen Dickelman's class, and uh, they would like to know who was your favorite author as a child. Oh, that's an easy one for me. It's uh, it's Beverly Cleary. I have to tell you that I, as an adult, I adore the Harry Potter books, but they weren't around when I was a kid, and I'm jealous of everyone who gets to read them as a ten-year-old. Uh, but for me, Beverly Cleary was my absolute favorite. I loved the Ramona books because Ramona felt so much like me. She got in trouble sometimes, and she put those burrs in her hair, and they got stuck, and I did stupid things like that too. So uh, I loved Ramona and uh, and Beverly Cleary. I love those as well. Everyone should read those books. They're great. Um, we have another online question, and it comes from a child named Ryder. Um, and he asks, or she, how do you know if you haven't put enough detail or too much detail into what you're writing? I will tell you that I am. I tend to be far more likely to make the latter mistake. Uh, because I get so excited about my research and probably you can tell when I'm holding up these journals and telling you about the skis that they wore on a particular day or not but I love that research and one of the hardest things for me with the Ranger and Time books is is paring it down uh, because I have so many cool facts that I learned about you know the Oregon Trail or, or how fugitive sla uh, slaves uh, used to um, you know plan and cooperate with one another and um, there are just so many cool 
really interesting facts in history, it can be really hard to pare that down and only use the things that truly serve the story. So probably that's the hardest thing for me. And quite often, I know when a friend tells me, when uh, you know my friend Linda reads the manuscript and says, you know, this is really cool, but it's a lot, and maybe you want to pare it down a little. Or when my editor does the same thing. Here's another question that's just come in that's probably pretty fun to answer. It's from Mrs. Marone's class, and they would like to know, how did you feel when you published your first book? Excited and scared. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, when my first book came out, it was The Brilliant Fall of Gianna Z. was my first book that was published nationally. And uh, I, I, the day it came out, I went to the mall, and I looked in our, our local bookstore that we had at the time, and there was this big display of them, and I had this terrible urge to just go gather them all up and run. Uh, it's, a, it's a funny thing because um, obviously it's exciting, and that's why you're writing books, to share them. But there is also this moment uh, when a book that has belonged only to you and characters that belong only to you for so long suddenly belong to the world. And there's a letting go that has to happen then, too. So um, it's interesting, and that hasn't changed. Every day a new book comes out. Uh, you know, the, 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 the third Ranger in Time book comes out December 29th. I will be excited and scared again. Sweet. Um, I think we have time for one more online question, and this comes from Rasley in Mrs. Cooney's class. Um, do you have a special place that you go when you write? Yes and no. So the truth is, I write all over the place. When I am traveling, I write on airplanes and in airports and in hotel rooms. When I am watching my daughter figure skate, I write in the bleachers at her figure skating practice. Um, I'm, I like to climb mountains, and I have a little notebook in my, my backpack, my, my day pack, that I, uh, I take out at the top and I write. But all that said, I do have a favorite place. I have a tiny little room in the basement of our house that overlooks Lake Champlain, and um, that is where I, I like to write. So that's where most of my writing gets done. Great. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today about your writing process. Um, it's really interesting to see how writers everywhere go through so many of the same steps, whether you're writing a book or a short story or even a third grade essay about tadpoles. So we really appreciated hearing from you, and we would like to say thank you for sharing all of your experience with us. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. What a gift to talk with so many writers on the National Day on Writing. I hope you guys enjoyed our chat as much as I did, and uh, I hope when we wrap up today, you're going to go do some writing. As soon as I finish here, uh, after I head home and have some lunch, I am actually going home to work on a brand new book. I have a book out now called How to Read a Story. That's all about the process of sharing a story together. And I am working on a follow-up to that book called How to Write a Story. And you can probably tell that I am still at the planning and brainstorming and organizing stage of that book. So I'm going to be working on that when I get home. I hope you'll be working on some writing today, too. Thank you so much. Um, we also really want to thank our participating classrooms for joining us today. So let's say goodbye to Ms. Leith's class in New Jersey. Bye! -bye. Bye. And th also thank you to Miss Gettler's class in Ohio. Thank you, we are teachers, Andrew Walter and Dave Kressner. <laughs> That's great, thank you. So thanks so much to everyone who joined us today. And as a reminder to everyone watching, there's a downloadable activity on our website which asks kids to plan and write their own Ranger story. Check it out and make sure to watch out for future authors in the classroom events. Thanks. Bye. Zaner Blozer's Strategies for Writers presents Authors in the Classroom, a live event where students hear directly from their favorite authors and learn about the joys and challenges of the writing process.